Lord God, immortal, invisible, God only wise, you are the ancient of days. We praise your great name. Thy justice like mountains high soaring above. Uh, you are so wonderful in all your ways. Holy Spirit, provide us illumination and discernment. Open the words of your holy word to our hearts and lives today. You're a God who is holy and perfect in judgment, yet merciful and full of grace. May you be glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, I have three divisions for tonight. And my aim tonight is uh, to show that God cares how his people treat others. So God cares how his people treat others. And I'll give you guys a minute to capture that because I'm going to jump right into my first division because I got a few illustrations built in. But division one is going to be Micah 1 to 3. And here we see that Micah denounced Israel and Judah's sin against God and man. Turn with me, men, to Micah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of uh, Moresheth during the reigns of Jotham, uh, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, the vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So we see here as we start off, this is occurring during the reign of three Judean kings that we've already studied. Uh, just a, a little bit of the historical backdrop, backdrop to anchor everyone, because for me, this history and timeline is one of my weakest things, so I, I wanted to spend a little time in it. If you turn, if you have the book and you turn to the front part, you have the timeline. If you guys are using the online resources, you could go to the resource library once you're logged into mybsf.com, and under the keyword search, you could just type in timeline, one word, and a PDF file is going to come up with the timeline. But this occurs during the reign of three Judean kings, roughly between 750 BC and 687 BC. And you can see exactly where uh, Micah kind of overlays, and it overlays the ministry of other prophets during this time, other prophets that we've already studied. So it's overlaying the ministry of Isaiah. It's also occurring uh, partially during the same time of Hosea, all right? So in 722 BC, we have the fall of Samaria and the exile of uh, Israel to Assyria. So it's most likely that what Micah is talking about is uh, occurring right at the cusp of, if not in the midst of, Israel being carried off by the Assyrians. Micah is delivering his message to Judah and it continues in uh, Micah chapter 1, verses 2 to 7. Read with me. Hear you peoples, all of you. Listen, earth, and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple, judgment against Samaria and Jerusalem. Right? Verse 3. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All, of the, all this is because of Jacob's transgressions, because of the sins of the people of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. Verse 7, all her idols will be broken into pieces. All her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images since she gathered her gifts from the wages of prostitutes. As the wages of prostitutes, they will be used again. So right here in the opening, we see judgment has been pronounced by the Lord God. Through our previous studies in 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Amos, Hosea, and Isaiah, we all have examined and seen the evidence of how idolatry has overtaken both Israel and Judah. Look, look with me at Mike, uh, Micah 1 verse 9. For Samaria's plague is incurable. It has spread to Judea. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. 
here's a challenging concept, but I, I felt it was very Im important to share because sometimes it may look or seem as though we're, you know, um, looking at a, or looking at two sides of the same thing and maybe not seeing it correctly. But the truth is that God alone is the one who can eradicate idolatry. You know, the lie that we often hear and believe is that we, in our own power, in our own strength, in our own wisdom, in our own knowledge, that we can detect and fight idolatry. I, I, I propose to you men that only God can eradicate idolatry from our lives, and the cure of idolatry in our lives comes from the Lord. So I ask you, what idolatries have a stronghold in your life right now? What relationships, thoughts, or places do you need to abandon because they lure you into idolatry? And will you ask God to reveal and eradicate idolatry in your life? And I start off with that because that's not my main principles and application, but I thought it was very important because that's what we've been dealing with uh, as, as we saw the progression of Israel and Judah into sin, uh, deeper and deeper into sin. I may have shared this with you uh, men before, but this is really the first time that I've read most of the prophetic books, and it's absolutely the first time that I've even ever studied them at any depth. I've always kind of held the prophetic books a, a little bit afar. And the biggest surprise to me as I look back on what I've learned is the amount of hope and goodness that the Lord proclaims amidst the darkness and evil of men. You know, one of the preconceived notions I had about the prophetic books is that it was all doom and gloom. And yeah, there were a few, um, you know, things that would point to Christ. But I was very amazed at how much hope there is even when God is pronouncing judgment. And we see another example of this right here in Micah. So if we look at Micah 2, verses 12 to 13, it, it reads, I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. Verse 13, the one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. So even in the opening uh, words where judgment is being poured out, where God's wrath is pending, we see hope being proclaimed even there, pointing to Christ, right? What else do we read about in the first three chapters of Micah? We have uh, quite a bit here. We have recorded sins of idolatry, as we discussed. We see the seizure of property and fraud for unrighteous gain. We see that in chapter 2, verses 2 and 9. In addition to that, we also see a failure of leadership, and a failure of leadership at multiple levels, right? We see a failure of civil leadership in Micah 3, 1 to 3, and 9 to 11. We see a failure of prophetic leadership in Micah 2, 6 to 11, and then 3, 5 to 7, and even verse 11 there. And then we also see a failure of religious leadership in Micah 3, verse 11. And as a result of all this failure and sin, we read the judgment that is to come. And uh, it's summarized in Micah 3, verse 12. It reads, Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will be, uh, become a heap of rubble. The temple, um, uh, the temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. The Lord's holy and righteous judgment is imminent, and it will fall upon Israel and Judah. And amidst this uh, judgment and hope in Micah 1 to 3, we, we come to our, our first principle. And my first principle here is that God sees and cares deeply about how we treat other people. You know, it's easy for us to note the corruption of Israel and even the modern day corruption that exists in our daily lives today. We talk about it uh, very frequently. Uh, we, we see it very clearly here as we study the prophetic books. But it becomes a bit more challenging and uncomfortable for us to detect the same type corruption in our own lives. But as we saw in Micah 2, verses 12 to 13, with the redemption given through Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, we can seek to rout out the corruption of sin in our lives. 
Uh, as I've shared before, I'm a parent, I have three kids. Uh, a lot of my illustrations come from them because I pretty much right now have three things I could do. I go to work, uh, spend time with the family, or I'm at BSF, right? So most of my analogies are gonna come from one of those three places. But uh, I have three kids. I have a 14-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a six-year-old. And on, on this particular occasion, my 10-year-old girl was uh, verbally berating my six-year-old boy, right? So six-year-old's our baby. And last week was spring break, so I had more time with the family, and I was watching this as my 10-year-old girl, I mean, literally just cut him down, and you could just see the life drain out of his face as he was taking this berating from, from my 10-year-old. Um, it was bad enough that I had to jump in and, of course, stop my daughter, and I had to reprimand her. But in addition to reprimanding her, I had to try to understand why my daughter was reacting the way it was, uh, the way she was, or behaving the way she was. Because again, this wasn't something major. This was something, I don't even remember what this was about. It's just one of those trivial things that you, you see kids fight over. But I started to probe into my daughter, asking her, well, do you see, uh, do you see me, you know, uh, treating you this way? Do you see me talking to you this way? Do you see my, your mother talking to you this way? By the way, I still think it's, it's my wife, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tyler, make sure my wife never gets a copy of this. But anyway, no, just kidding. It's, it's definitely not my wife. But I started to probe in, and I actually started to get convicted by this because my daughter, who's being raised under my care, is a reflection of who I am. And I started to think about is it something in me that I'm doing to her or something in my character that she's reflecting back on my six-year-old? Even though my daughter answered no, and I'm still trying to figure out if she answered no because she thought that was the right answer or not, I was still convicted by that moment. God sees and cares deeply about how we treat other people. God cares about how we transact business, how we interact with strangers, uh, airline gate agents uh, when your flight is canceled, uh, nasty wait staff, horribly rude co-workers. Um, God cares. God cares about how I respond to my wife after a rough day or how I view and treat what we would consider as the least of these. God sees it all and cares about it all. So a few application questions from this, man. How does your view of God impact the way you treat others? And conversely, how does how you treat others reflect what you hold true to be about God? What may you need to change about how you view God and treat others? Division two. So division two, we have uh, Micah four to five. And here, Micah proclaimed the coming king and kingdom. Let's pick up with Micah chapter 4, verse 1. Read with me, men. So let's read 1 to 5. The mountain of the Lord. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. For the Lord Almighty has spoken. Verse 5, all the nations may walk in the names of their gods. We will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. A little aside here, Micah 4, verse 3, I'm sure that sounds pretty familiar to you all. It's also referenced in Isaiah chapter 2 and also in Joel chapter 3. 
And it's also probably, you might have seen it even in, in secular speeches. You might see it referenced in uh, uh, different politicians' uh, political speeches as well, because we see here a very noble idea, right? World peace, where swords can be beaten into plowshares. I came across, as I was trying to figure out, oh, thank you. Uh, Tyler, as I was trying to figure out, I was trying to figure out what is a plowshare, right? Like I know what a big plow looks like that you would pull from, from a, a, with an oxen, but a plowshare is actually a component in a plow, right? So there's a little piece inside that goes up above to help, you know, uh, turn up the soil. And as I was doing, uh, doing research on trying to understand what a plowshare is, I came across this sculpture. And the sculpture is titled, Let Us Beat uh, Swords Into Plowshares. And it's a sculpture by, uh, oh, I'm going to butcher this Russian name. But look it up. You could, <laughs> you could pronounce the name yourselves. But this was actually a sculpture gifted by the Soviet Union back in 1959 to the United Nations. And originally when I came across it, I'm a New Yorker, as many of you may know. I was like, I know that bridge in the background. That's the Queensboro Bridge, and that's what caught my eye. But this is actually up in, apparently up in New York. But this represents a great ideal that the world would all agree upon. But how quickly would the world agree upon what it would take to get there? Because according to the word of the Lord, that will come at the second coming of Christ. Now back to Micah 4, verse 5. In this passage, we note the restoration of the position and purpose of Israel as st stated by God, walking in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So here we see in the last days, in, in the final days, that Israel will be restored to what their true purpose was in God. If we move on to Micah chapter 5, verses 1 to 15, we read about a promised ruler from Bethlehem. And again, wow, what beautiful hope we read here, all pointing to Christ. Let's read verse uh, 5, verse 4, uh, Micah 5, verse 4. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. In this section, we have prophecy pointing not only to the first coming of Christ, uh, as we see in Micah 5, verses 1 to 6, but we also see prophecy that also points forward to the ultimate establishment of God's coming king and kingdom in Micah 5, verses 7 to 15. Christ will come again to eradicate sin and death from the earth and restore his people. And this brings me uh, to our doctrine for, for this week, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at this doctrine of uh, a few important points, Jesus first came to earth to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin, and Christ will come again to rule and reign on earth uh, before mankind's final judgment. Jesus will come in the clouds, and in great glory, every eye will see him. Only God the Father knows the exact time that Jesus will return, as noted in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But just as Christ's first coming was prophesied and fulfilled, so it will be with uh, Christ's second coming. It will come to pass. New Testament scripture consistently calls God's people to await Jesus' return with readiness and expectant hope. Jesus Christ, our Savior, will return to fulfill every promise of God, which is noted in his word. Now, when I don't believe that Jesus will come again, God and his purpose seems disconnected from my life and the modern world. Human history just seems to roll forward without any identifying or meaningful and meaningful purpose or direction. The resolution that I long for escapes me as I witness and experience the chaos and trouble in this world. Now, when I do believe that God's son, Jesus Christ, will come again to earth, I know that God has an undeniable plan, and no matter how discouraging or desperate the world may seem, as God's child, I know that he will come to deliver a lasting hope and victory that the world cannot offer. And I live today prepared for Jesus to call, call me home or to come. The promise of Jesus' return offers the hope and resolution we so long for. 
the note stated very well um, uh, towards the end. It says, the world is not falling apart, but rather falling into place. God's irrevocable control of the end of the story stabilizes his children when current events or daily life seem confusing or discouraging. Jesus will reign on earth, bring final judgment, and establish his eternal kingdom where sin, pain, and death can enter no more. The Son of God will come, and this should be our greatest source of hope. And a few things to consider on, on the points of this doctrine. As I stated before, the world is headed for this glorious conclusion orchestrated by God and implemented by Jesus. The certainty of Jesus' return provides us stabilizing hope uh, uh, to those who trust in him for his salvation. And, and I, I bring that as a very important point because if you're not looking forward to that second coming of Jesus, I'll, I'll challenge you guys in a minute as to why you're not. But God calls every believer to await expectantly for Jesus' return with readiness. And this brings me to my second principle. God's Son, Jesus Christ, will return and rule the world with perfect justice, mercy, and love. So, uh, spring break, right? So we we're doing some fun family events. So one of the things, again, I have a younger family. So one of the events that we had planned for our staycation here in Florida was to do an escape room. I don't know if anybody here has done an escape room, but it could be uh, pretty fun. It could be also an awesome telltale of uh, interpersonal dynamics in a team or a family, right? But anyway, we, we decided we'll do, a, uh, do an escape room, just our family. So we got into the room, they set the stage, they set the story, and for those who haven't done an escape room, there's you know typically a storyline and there's multiple puzzles that you have to solve as a group and work together to get to the final conclusion and you know either save the day or avoid destruction. So uh, we had about an hour for this one room and there were about five puzzles, six puzzles that we had to solve. And in, within the span of about an hour, uh, we got all of those done in about 40 minutes. And we were like, oh, this is great. We got 20 minutes to spare. So we punch in the code to the last lock based on the puzzle. And then there's a bookshelf in the room and the bookshelf uh, swings open as doors to another room. And apparently we walk into the other room and with 20 minutes left, there's like another eight puzzles in there to solve. So it was, we were just like, we thought we had made it to the end, but that wasn't it. And we walked into the second, even cooler room and we're like, man, we should have hurried up in this other room. Now, again, my point in that illustration is that, men, there, there is a second room. And, you know, it's different from my illustration in that we're assured that that second room is coming, right? God has clearly stated to us that Christ came, uh, Christ came and God has clearly stated to us that Christ will come again. Christ came, died, and rose again, providing us redemption. But before he left his, this earth, he promised us that he will come again in glor glory. Thank God. See Matthew chapter 24 in case you want to you know, find some more details on that. But God's Son, Jesus Christ, will return and rule the world with perfect justice, mercy, and love. So some application questions from that. As I alluded to earlier, are you looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ? And if not, why not? How are you encouraged by the certain and ultimate victory that God has promised through Christ? All right, time check here, 805, not bad. So division three, uh, Mike, Micah six verses, uh, I'm sorry, Micah chapter six to seven. Uh, Micah declares God's indictment and recalls God's mercy. And I wanted to specifically use the word indictment there because that's a pretty technical term there, right? That's a term we see used in a courtroom. But it's the same, uh, I would say, you know, if you're not from a legal background, that it could, we could also look at this as Micah declares God's charges and recalls God's mercy. So as we start off in Micah 6, the Lord has a case against Israel. Hmm. Brace yourself. 
Yeah, I mean, personally, I like courtroom dramas, but the last courtroom I want to be in is one where I'm standing trial and the Lord is the prosecutor. That is, unless Jesus is there with me. Now, Micah 6 starts out with a, uh, with a courtroom uh, setting. Let, let's pick up Micah 6, verses uh, 1 and 2. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills, let the hills hear what, I, what you have to say. Hear you, mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. Now, although it starts with a courtroom, we quickly see God's faithfulness, mercy, and grace shine through in the coming verses. Read with me Micah chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of sl slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aram, uh, Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Here, the mention of Balak and Balaam, uh, taken from Numbers 22, uh, chapters 22 to 24, remind the Israelites that the Lord longs to bless rather than curse them. Now, re re recounting the covenant-keeping deliverances of the past, uh, the, the, peop uh, the people of Israel crossed the Jordan uh, as they were fleeing from Israel into the prom promised land. Uh, they crossed the Jordan from Sh Shittim to Gilgal in the final portion of their journey. And this is recorded in Joshua chapters 2, 3, and 4. And at Shittim, we see that the covenant was broken in Numbers 25 when the people go and follow uh, Baal. And at Gilgal, we see that the covenant is renewed. And that's recorded in Joshua chapter 5. It was at Gilgal also that the first Passover was observed once they crossed over into Canaan. So there's some really weighty significance here in these uh, just short verses here. But they're meant to recant and encourage Israel that although God is listing these charges and although judgment is going to fall, that God is also going to provide his goodness, his mercy, his grace. Let's look at Micah chapter 6. Micah continues, uh, and this is Micah now speaking. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Wow, look at that. It's funny here. God doesn't ask for that, does he? He doesn't ask for our firstborn for our sins, even though our sins require that level, right? God never asks us to do that. But the beautiful thing, the wonderful thing, is that we see that God provides his very own son for our trans transgressions. God provides Although God's holiness and divine perfection demand death um, uh, do, because of our sins, and even though our sin demands a payment of, uh, of a debt that's owed, God doesn't ask us to provide that. Just like with Abraham, God demands, what God demands of us is obedience, a heart that seeks and follows him. Just like Abraham on the mountain with Isaac, as Abraham followed God in obedience, God provides the sacrifice needed to redeem. God provides the redemption, and thanks, thanks be to God. And what should our response be? How are we to respond from that? Let's look at Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, it's a very well-known uh, verse, right, in Micah 6, 8. We have a song about it, but it's also recorded back in Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 to 17. So even back then, the Lord had proclaimed that. 
As we come to a close, in chapter 7, we have Micah's lament over Israel, and then we also see a glimpse of Israel's restoration that's to come. In Micah 7, verses 1 to 7, in the face of bleak circumstances, Micah trusted God and his promise of restoration. Let's look closely at Micah 7, verse 7. But as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. When we look at Micah 7, verses 8 to 20, we see God's mercy for a repentant Israel. And, and though they're devastated by judgment, God's people will rise again. They would confess their sin, acknowledge God's justice, and anticipate God's restoration and mercy. Michael's, uh, Micah's final words record focus on God's steadfast love. Who is like you, God? Let's look at Micah 7, verses 18 to 20. Who is like you? Uh, who, is, who is a God like you? who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You will not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sin underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be faithful to Jacob and show love to Abraham as you pledged an oath uh, to on an oath to our ancestors in days long ago. It's amazing. We see this is almost like Micah signing his name at the end because if you, when you read through the notes, you'll see uh, Micah actually means who is like Yahweh or who is like our God. How fitting a close to the book of Micah. And that brings me to my final principle. God's faithfulness, forgiveness, and mercy call us to live rightly in this world. <clears throat> Understanding our sin and God's faithfulness, mercy, uh, forgiveness and mercy, this should all increase our view and love of who God is. Uh, conversely, as the notes will state, lack of love for God inevitably, inevitably distorts our love for anything else. So that means our families, our friendships, how we interact with our neighbors, how we interact with strangers, how we view the world. God's faithfulness, forgiveness, and mercy call us to live rightly in this world. So as I close, a few application questions on this. Who or what do you seek to fulfill your deepest need and longing? Where in your life do you need the overflow of God's love to reach and penetrate? And how have you experienced God's mercy and forgiveness? How has this changed how you view the world and are, interact with those in your home, at work, and in your neighborhood? Let's pray, man. <clears throat> Lord, you are so good. No one, nothing compares to you, Lord God. Empower us to live in a way that reflects your heart May what we study at BSF be not only for the accrual of knowledge and facts, but may our hearts, minds, and lives be transformed by, by the truth that you, O oh Lord, reveal to us um, by our study of your holy and precious word. Be with us tonight as we dismiss. Be with us this week. Holy Spirit, be with each of our men. Guard them, instruct them, bless them. May they be salt and light in their families, in their friendships, and in the world around them, Lord Jesus. We ask all this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.